second chapter entitled College, Marriage, and Gandhi's Movement. We had just completed one section where Srila Prabhupada had given up voluntarily his bachelor's degree at the Scottish Church's College. Now he tried his hand at writing poetry for the occasion of a friend's wedding. He read Srimad Bhagavatam and the latest speeches of Gandhi. He had no immediate plans. So at this juncture in Srila Prabhupada's life, we have to understand where all this information is coming from about Srila Prabhupada. Srila Prabhupada, we only knew him from the age of 70 to the age of 81. That's quite advanced in life. And when someone reaches that age in their life, especially at the last year of Prabhupada's life, they begin to reminisce, reminisce. They remember their childhood, their youthhood, all of their accomplishments. And as the body breaks down more and more, they take more shelter in the things they were able to do before when the body was working very nicely. So especially in the last year of Srila Prabhupada's life, when he was here in Vrindavan, he very much remembered about his childhood, his youthhood, his married life, meeting his spiritual master. And it's at that time we got the most information about Srila Prabhupada's life. Fortunately, Tamal Krishna Maharaj, he was able to write this all down in his diary. So, in Prabhupada's own words, we can then understand what Prabhupada's life was like that then. So here it says that he read Srimad Bhagavatam and the latest speeches of Gandhi. He had no immediate plans. So Prabhupada said at that time, he was addicted to Gandhi's movement. <laughs> and he actually worshipped Gandhi. And now why was that? Gormahande, he understood that when Srila Prabhupada, as a, as, a social, as, he, as a social statement, he refused his BA degree from the college. Gormahande, though he had many plans for Prabhupada that depended upon that degree, he did not stop Abhai from doing what he did because he saw that Abhai was simultaneously maintaining an attraction to spiritual life. Therefore, he was also reading Srimad Bhagavatam. 
Gormahan had his plans for Abai, and the college degree had been an integral part of those plans. But Krishna, it seemed, had other plans. The political protest of refusing the Bachelor of Arts degree was more a mark of honor than a social stigma, and Gormahan did not reproach his son for it. But Abai still needed to take up some kind of work. Gormahan approached his friend Kartik Bosch and asked him to employ Abai. Now, Dr. Kartik Chandra Bosch was a very famous gentleman. We remember at the very beginning of Prabhupada's life when he was only one and a half years old, he got typhoid. And the doctor, who was Dr. Kartik Chandra Bosch, he told Gormahande that you have to give your son chicken juice. Now, Dr. Bosch was a very practical man. And he created hundreds of cures, chemicals, formulas within the chemical industry. So much so that he set up his own laboratory. And he also was the managing director of Bengal Chemicals Company, which was the most famous at that time. He was the first chemist and doctor to manufacture the medicines that the British had monopolized and they were selling. So he held a very important role in this period of Bengali history. And that uh, his influence then spread all over India. But being a practical man, when Abai later became his uh, manager, because Abai was a follower of Gandhi, he wore the Kadi, and that was also a social statement. And Dr. Bosch said at that time that the only thing I like about Gandhi's movement is this Kadi. He wasn't interested in the political side. He wasn't even interested in the nationalism. He was a very practical person. He was an industrialist. And he said that if everyone would produce their own Kadi, then this would create a lot of industry for the people in the country. So this is the pragmatic mind that Srila Prabhupada was working under at that time. Dr. Kartik Chandra Bose, an intimate friend, had been the family doctor since Abai's childhood. He was a distinguished surgeon, a medical scholar, and a chemical industrialist. He had his own establishment, Bose's laboratory in Calcutta, where he manufactured drugs, soaps, and other products for this pharmaceutical industry. Dr. Bose was well known throughout India as the first Indian to manufacture pharmaceutical preparations that had formerly been monopolized by European firms. He agreed to accept Abai as a department manager at his laboratory. Now, how could that have been? Abai had just graduated from college. He had no working experience. His subjects were philosophy, history, and economy. He knew nothing about the chemical field. But because of the confidential and intimate relationship between Gormahan and Kartik Chandra Bosch, Kartik Chandra once asked Prabhupada's sister, what is Abai doing now? And his sister said, he's got his BA, but now he's not doing anything. So at the request of Gormahan, Kartik Chandra asked Abai, why don't you come and work for me? So Abai, he thought if he would just read a few books, he would be able to learn the industry. And being very intelligent, he was able to take up that task. Now, some of the other workers in the laboratory had been working for up to 40 years for Dr. Bosch. And when they saw that this young boy was being made the manager of their department, three or four of them were quite unhappy. And they spoke amongst themselves. And finally, they went to Dr. Bosch. And they said, why have you put this young boy on top of us? We've been working for you for so many years. 
And Dr. Bo says, no, this is not that kind of a work. I have to have someone who I completely trust, just like my own son. And this boy, I have known him since childhood. He has to sign checks up to 40,000 rupees. And because he's just like a son to me, therefore I put him in this position. Now Prabhupada took that and raised it to a higher level. He said that this confidentiality, this is the same way that Krishna was able to speak Bhagavad Gita to Arjun. Although Arjun wasn't a Brahmin, he wasn't a scholar, because they had a close and trusting relationship, Krishna could give all that information to Arjun. So in the same way, because Kartik Chandra Bosch, he had a very trusting and loving relationship with Srila Prabhupada as, his, as if he were his own son. Therefore, he could give him such a responsible post. Now, Prabhupada also said that when he was a child, he had four toys. He had his two guns that we heard about. He had a cow that if you squeezed on a rubber tube, the cow would jump. <laughs> he had a dog that used to dance. And that dog was given to him by Dr. Bosch because one time Prabhupada had a, a, something wrong with the side of him. So Dr. Bosch gave him that to, to pacify him as a little child. And then Prabhupada went on to say that there were four people in his life who loved him very much. One was his father, the other was his mama, his mother's, not really mother's brother, but first cousin. Uh, the mother was the daughter of, this, of the brother, and her, her father's sister had a son. So that son, his name was Rakul Chandrarai. He took mother Rajani of Prabhupada to be just like his sister. He was very wealthy. And he loved Prabhupada just like his own son. And it so happens that the family on the Rajani side was not only very devotional but also wealthy. So he was also very pleased. And Kartik Chandra Bosch, he told Rako Raj that this boy is very intelligent, therefore I have put him in this position. So it was those two, the father and the mama, and it was Dr. Chand uh, Kartik Chandra Bosch and his own spiritual master, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. Those four love Prabhupada very much. And Prabhupada will hear next week about how Srila Prabhupada met his spiritual master. He said, I was worthless. I had no special qualities, but my spiritual master loved me very much. He was a Calcutta man, and I was also from Calcutta. And all of his other disciples, they were from East Bengal. <laughs> so we, he had a special love for me, and therefore he confided in me very much also. So these four people molded Prabhupada's life. And then while Prabhupada was here reminiscing about his relationship with Dr. Bosch, he, he described some of the lessons that he learned from him that we can also put into our life. He said in his factory, he had a sulfuric acid machine. And you would put sulfur into the machine, and the machine would fuse it, and then coming out would be sulfuric acid. And one day the machine broke down and it wasn't producing the acid. And all of the scientists who worked in the laboratory, they were looking in their books, they were consulting together. They couldn't figure out how to get the machine working. But Dr. Bosch, all he did was, he went to another chemical lab, and working in that lab was a Muslim worker who took care of the machinery. And he said to him, he said, you come for a minute to my shop, we have some problem with our machine. So that man came, and he adjusted something in the machinery, and immediately the sulfuric acid came out. So Prabhupada learned from that the practicality, that it's not just a theoretical knowledge, 
You have to have practical understanding of the work that you're doing. Also, Dr. Bosch confided in Prabhupada in something very special. He said that, actually, I have sinned. Because when you get a hold of a rich patient, you harass them like anything for money. You can say to them, do you want a slow cure or do you want a fast cure? And the rich man will say, I'm making 20 rupees a day. That was a lot of money in those days. So I can give you all the money you need, but you give me the fast cure. And in that way, they would able to be able to get so much money from that rich patient. And another thing that Dr. Bose confided in Prabhupada was that sometimes they would just take a little distilled water and they would sell it in a bottle for five rupees because the people wouldn't know what it was. And if they mixed it with something, they couldn't sell it for so much. So he was actually confessing to Prabhupada that in this job there's cheating. And yes, I admit, I've done some cheating and I'm very sorry for that now. So Dr. Bosch, he trusted Srila Prabhupada so much that now Prabhupada was 21 years old. We'll read more now. Although Abhai knew little of the pharmaceutical industry or of management, he felt confident that by reading a few related books, he could learn what he needed to know. But when this new young man was suddenly given the post of department manager, several workers became dissatisfied. Some of them were elderly and had been 40 years with the firm. They voiced their dissatisfaction amongst themselves and finally confronted Dr. Bosch. Why had this young man been put in charge? Dr. Bosch replied, Oh, for that position, I needed someone I could trust like my own son. He is signing checks for 40,000 rupees. I could only entrust the personal handling of my accounts in that department to him. His father and I are very close, and this young man is known to me practically as my son. So Prabhupada said that Dr. Bosch took him to be like the prototype of a son. And he also would tell him about his childhood. Dr. Bosch said that his father's name was Prasanna Bosch. And he was a go-down manager for one European man named Mr. Morrison. And the young boy, Kartik Chandra, he was at the go-down one day with his father. And he saw there in the go-down a big sack of doll. And there was a hole in the sack and the doll was falling out. So he is a little boy, he was picking up the doll and trying to put it back into the, into the sack. So Mr. Morrison saw what the little boy was doing and he said to the father, he said, this boy is very intelligent. He will become very wealthy when he gets older. So in that way, Dr. Bosch was just like a father speaks to his son, telling about his own life and how he became so famous and wealthy through this practice. Now, Sarup Damodar Maharaj, when Prabhupada said that uh, Dr. Bosch was the founder of Bengal Chemical Company, because that was a very famous company all over India, Sarup Damodar said, well, I thought that was Praful Chandra Roy, who was another great scientist, who founded the Bengal Chemical Company. And Prabhupada corrected him. He said that actually, Kartik Chandra Bose, he was the managing director because he was an industrialist. He set it up. But because Praful Chandra Rai, he was a chemist, he was in the front of the line. So he became famous as the founder, although it was Dr. Bose who founded the company. So Prabhupada, although we'll read later about his uh, his, his own occupation. At this point in time, he was 21 years old when he had just been appointed as the manager. He had just had his first son. His son's name was Mathura Mohan. Prabhupada had three sons. The eldest was Mathura Mohan. 
then there was Prayagraj, and then there was Vrindavan Chandra. So while Prabhupada was here, he was unable to move, he hadn't eaten for months. His youngest son came to see him, Vrindavan Chandra. There was financial difficulties. They had lost the house that Prabhupada had given to them because they didn't pay the, you know, so many things within the family. Prabhupada was very disappointed. And then Prabhupada started to remember about Mathura Mohan being the first son. So Mathura Mohan, of course, this is a little ahead, but because this was the first son, he had so much affection for him. And he was very devoted. This was the son that Prabhupada took to Radhakun, and he would always go to the uh, Bhag Bazar Mandir to see Gurudev. And he was treated just like a grandson by Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, Ban Maharaj, Sridhar Maharaj. They all loved the little boy very much. And he would follow Janmashtami, Brat. Although he was a little boy, he wouldn't even drink water, so much so that he would even faint sometimes. So Prabhupada was remembering all of these qualities of his first son. And then, very emotionally, he said to Vrindavan at that time, he said, you tell him, you tell him to come here. I want to see him in my last days. But he didn't come. Now why was that? That was because Although he was very devotional in his youth, being the first son, when Prabhupada left the house at age eight, 50, he fell into bad association and he became a communist. And it was these communists that turned his mind so that he became inimical then to devotional service, to all types of religious activities. And it was he who made the court case against ISKCON saying that ISKCON was a family business and all of the temples belonged to the family. Th that way he lost everything because it was the, lo the advocates who tricked him. So still Prabhupada had so much love for this first son of his who was born at this time. Then also Prabhupada was reminiscing about his wife. Although sannyasis, they never, should, they never think about their previous life, but in a condition like this, when one is uh, very weakened and cannot move, then they start remembering about their past. So he says she was very faithful. And the problem was, very faithful and very devoted wife, but she was very proud because she came from a wealthy family. Even though she was uneducated, she was still proud. And then he gave the example of when he came back after being um, away in Allahabad for some time, she was staying in the home of her father. And that night she brought Prabhupada some singara and kachori from the shop, outside shop. And he said, well, why are you bringing me from outside? She said, well, the, the cook was sick today, so nobody cooked. So, <laughs> so then Prabhupada realized that if I keep her here in her father's house because he's a wealthy man, she'll just get spoiled more and more. So then he moved out of the father's house and they got their own place. We'll hear about that later. But despite being a sannyasi, despite giving up his family, he still had affection because there was devotion in his life, in the family life, in the early days. Now, because Vrindavan was here visiting Prabhupada, Tamal Krishna, he made a plan. He took Vrindavan to the Radhadamadar temple for prasadam. And at that time, he started to ask Vrindavan about what Prabhupada's Grihastha life was like in the early days. And Vrindavan explained to him that every morning at five o'clock, Prabhupada would wake up and he would do puja and he would make an offering to, his, to Radha and Krishna. And then again, in the evening, he would have the puja and kirtan, and he would read from Srimad Bhagavatam at that time. And that was the way the family went on, with the puja in the morning and the evening. And on special occasions, he would go to the Bhagavad temple. 
So the whole family was brought up in devotional service under the care of Srila Prabhupada, the father, and Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. So they all had that opportunity to become devotees because of Prabhupada's care for them in their childhood. Gormahan felt he had done his best. His prayer was that the principles of pure Vaishnavism he had taught his son would stay with him and guide him throughout his life. Gandhi and the cause of Swaraj had disrupted Abai's college career, and Abai was still inclined towards nationalism, but not so much for a political motive as for a spiritual vision. So Gormahan was content. Now, a spiritual vision of Swaraj, that was because Srila Prabhupada, he saw, particularly in Bengal, the oppression at that time. Now, we'll read further about, Prabhupada explained that during the British era, the Britons, they did not take any tax from the people. They left them to do their religion and to, to practice their culture as they wished. But they were only interested in exploiting the people on behalf of England. So they did that by forcing the farmers to grow what they needed instead of growing food. There's a particular plant called indigo. So they made pacts, they made contracts with the, Beng the poor, very poor Bengali farmers. Indigo is what makes the blue dye in cloth, like what you're wearing now nowadays. It's made from chemicals. In those days, it was made from a plant, the indigo. So instead of growing rice and dal and things that they could eat, they had the poor farmers grow this indigo and grow cotton. And they would buy the indigo and buy the cotton, take it back to England, make cloth, and sell that cloth to the Indians, bring it back here. We'll read about that. In this way, they were able to extract so much money from the country. And therefore, just on behalf of England, they were exploiting the poor Indian people. So Srila Prabhupada, seeing that very prominently in Bengal, he understood that these people had to be liberated from the exploitation so that they could follow their own culture without any type of uh, suppression from the British. And Prabhupada, he made that statement by becoming a follower from 1917. Now, we heard last week that when Gandhi was in England, he met up with the Vegetarian Society. And at that time, he made friendship with the leaders there in England. One of them was a woman named Ani Basant. So in, 19, in 1917, Ani Dusan came here and Gandhi made her the president of the Congress party. And Prabhupada joined the party from that time. And he continued up to this time, 1921. He became more and more involved on behalf of the nation so that the people could become free from this exploitation. Gormahan knew the marriage arrangement was not pleasing to Abai. But Abai had accepted his explanation that detachment from wife and family affairs would be good for spiritual advancement. And Abai was showing an inherent disinterest in materialistic affairs. This also did not displease Gormahan, to whom business had always been subservient to his worship of Lord Krishna. He had expected this. Now Abai had a promising job and would be making the best of his marriage. Gormahan had done what he could and he depended on Krishna for the ultimate result. So the um, friends of Gormahan, when they saw that Abai was an intelligent young boy, they recommended that he be sent to England to become a barrister. And Gurmahan said, no, I will never let my son become a Malecha. 
But Srila Prabhupada heard this. And when he came to this age, he was thinking, I want to go to England. <laughs> he said, why didn't my father let me go to England? He said, I want to marry a white English girl and, and I want to have white children. <laughs> this is what Prabhupada said here in Vrindavan. And then he said, and then when I did go to London with, my, with his disciples after he opened up the temples, I was walking past the law college there and I remembered this. And then he said, now I have so many white children without the difficulty of a white wife. <laughs> then also, when Kartik Chandra Bose was convincing Prabhupada to become the manager, he asked Prabhupada, what are you doing? It was this interim time. He said, well, I'm doing shares. Shares is like stock market. You buy part of a company and you make profit by interest. And Dr. Bose said to him, well, that's no way to spend your life. That's what the Marwaris do, and the Marwaris are completely illiterate and uneducated. You have an education. You should come and be the manager. <laughs> you shouldn't do shares. So in that way, Prabhupada was convinced to come and become the manager. But then Prabhupada, he said that uh, after he met Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, he decided he wanted to become very wealthy, just like in this beautiful bhajan by Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur. Of course, Bhakti Vinod Thakur, he's singing this for our, on our behalf. It's not that he was actually in this condition. So when you enter into married life, you have to maintain a wife, and the family grows and grows and grows. Prabhupada had five children by his wife. He also said that because of his wife, uh, he was, he would spend very late nights with her. And because of that, he neglected his studies in his college. But later, he neglected his wife. But he still had to maintain the family. So he wanted to make a lot of money. And therefore, Dr. Bose said, well, why don't you, you become my agent in North India, from Mughal Sarai to Delhi? Prabhupada set up a huge business. He was so successful. But because he was so young, Prabhupada explained, just like in this bhajan, he, was, he said he became very puffed up. And Krishna clouded his intelligence because his agency was so successful that all the other companies came to him and wanted to hire him. Bengal Chemical and uh, English companies, Far Company, all these companies that might not even be in existence now. And they tried to hire Prabhupada. And they were giving him very good terms. But Prabhupada, he said, oh, they're all coming to me. They all want me. But I want to do it on my terms. So he wouldn't accept their terms. And he said, actually, this was Krishna's trick. He was clouding my intelligence, making me puffed up, so that I would lose everything. Because if I had accepted their terms, then I would have become very wealthy and forgotten all about him. And then he quoted the uh, 1088.8, where Krishna says in the Srimad Bhagavatam that when I favor a person, I gradually take everything away from that person. And their svajana, their friends, their family, reject him. And then in great distress, they then turn to me and they realize they have no other shelter but me. So in this way, Prabhupada saw on a long-term vision that though in his youth he was very successful at his business, Krishna gradually took everything away from him so that Krishna could bring him onto the line of coming to America and preaching Krishna consciousness all over the world. Gandhi, bolstered by his emergence as a leader among the Congress party, now openly attacked the empire's exploitative cloth trade with India. England was purchasing raw cotton from India at the lowest prices, manufacturing it into cloth in the Lancashire mills in England, and then selling the monopolized cloth at, a high, at high prices 
to the Indian millions. Gandhi's propaganda was that India should return to making her own cloth using simple spinning wheels and hand looms, thus completely boycotting the British-made cloth and attacking an economic base of Britain's power over India. Traveling by train throughout the country, Gandhi repeatedly appealed to his countrymen to reject all foreign cloth and wear only the simple coarse khadi produced from India's own cottage industry. Before the British rule, India had spun and woven her own cloth. Gandhi argued that by breaking the cottage industries, the British were sinking the Indian masses into semi-starvation and lifelessness. So last week we heard that Gandhi had gone to Jagannath Puri just after Prabhupada had visited. Now, Prabhupada went for spiritual pilgrimage because he had worshipped Lord Jagannath his whole life. But Gandhi, he had come to Jagannath Puri on a political campaign. And it was this campaign of the Charka, the Charka movement, where everyone should take all of their um, Western cloth, they would bring it into big piles, and then Gandhi would burn that cloth in front of everyone. So when Gandhi went to take darshan of Lord Jagannath, he noticed that Jagannath was wearing English cloth, the milk cloth. And he said, he wrote, he said there are hundreds of virgin maidens who could be making from the charka, you make the threads. They could be making the threads. And there are thousands of weavers who could be weaving the cloth for Jagannath. But here I see that they're using the milk cloth for the deity. Previously, the Hindus, they would not touch anything Western. Even the subjis, the begun, the tomato was called bulati begun. No Hindu would touch a tomato. They wouldn't eat it, they would throw it. Just because it was from the West. They would never wear milk cloth because it was from the West. They would never take Western medicine. And Dr. Bose also confided, confided in Prabhupada. He said, I have to flatter the people hundreds of times just to take this Western medicine, <laughs> trying to trick them. And Prabhupada explained to us that the British, they turned the minds of the Indians. He said that previously, we were sitting with Prabhupada in Mayapur. He was explaining this era in India when the British, he, by propaganda, they convinced the Indians that anything from the West is best. West is best, right? So before, if you needed to, a knife, let's say you just had to go and get a chaku, you go to the smithy, he makes a chaku, and that knife will last your whole life. That's how well made it was. But the British, they had factories in the West and they would make thousands of knives every day. We see that even in present day. Now you buy a pen, the pen will last for one month, then you have to throw it. You can't even put the refill anymore, you just throw it, you have to buy a new pen. Every month you have to buy a new pen. So this is what the British, this was their gift. <laughs> that if you buy things from the West, it's best. And they would make their medicines, they would make everything, and they would write, made in England. And then the people, they would say, oh, it's made in England, it must be better. Even, Prabhupada says, it, even Nehru, because Nehru would come to his agency, he would only buy Western medicine, although he was the, the president. <laughs> so this was propaganda, and Gandhi was trying to break that. Then, when Gandhi saw the poverty and the famine in Orissa, because he had traveled all over the country by that time, how the poor indigo farmers, they were all starving to death. And then he saw that in Orissa, although they weren't growing cotton, they weren't growing indigo, they were also starving to death. And his solution was, everyone should take up the charka and make their own cloth and that will stop the starvation. This is how he saw it. Now, Prabhupada explains that 
Gandhi did not like the Krishna who fights. So what he did was, he created his own Krishna from the Bhagavad Gita who was non-violent. And that was the Krishna that he used to quote. The, yes, it was the same slokas, but he didn't like when Krishna fought because he felt that the only solution was non-violence. So this, uh, and then Prabhupada, gradually he totally rejected that. He said that Gandhi for 30 years in South Africa, he tried to make the Indians on par with the Westerners and he failed. And then he came to India and for 20 years he tried to get this independence. He said the best he could do was he could sit with the Englishmen in his cotty loincloth and he thought, oh, now they've accepted me. But according to Prabhupada, it was not Gandhi who won the independence. It was Subhash Chandra Bosch. So Prabhupada at that time, he became a follower of Subhash Chandra Bosch and of C.R. Chittaranjan Das, who were both also for Swaraj, but they had a different concept of how they were going to get this Swaraj. Now when Gandhi and his political campaign came to Calcutta, the uh, disciples of Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, they went to meet him to invite him to come to the temple to meet Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. And Gandhi asked them, he said, you have Charka in your temple? Charka is my God. I worship the Charka. So this was a misconception. And Prabhupada gradually, gradually he was understanding this as he grew older and he saw that Gandhi's movement was not working through this only ch charka and nonviolence. To set the example, Gandhi himself worked daily at a primitive spinning wheel and wore only a simple coarse loincloth loin cloth and shawl. He would hold meetings and ask people to come forth and reject their imported cloth. On the spot, people would throw down heaps of cloth and he would set it ablaze. Gandhi's wife complained that the kadi was too thick and not convenient to wear while cooking. She asked if while cooking, she could wear the light British made cloth. Yes, you're free to cook with your milk cloth on, Gandhi had told her, but I must exercise a similar freedom by not taking the meal so prepared. So this was Gandhi's pro platform of protest. He protested against the milk cloth. He protested against the indigo. He protested against the salt tax. And he felt that he was making progress in that way. But according to Srila Prabhupada, it wasn't until Subhash Chandra Bosch took to arms that the British finally were able to realized that they weren't going to be able to keep control of India anymore. The cause of cottage industry appealed to Abai. He too was not enamored with the modern industrial advances the British had introduced in India. Not only was simple living good for the long-term national economy of hundreds of millions of Indians, as Gandhi was emphasizing, but to Abai it was also the way of life most conducive to spiritual culture. Abai put aside his mill manufactured cloth and took to wearing khadi. Now his dress revealed him to whomever he met, British and Indian alike. He was a nationalist, a sympathizer of revolution. To wear khadi in India in the early 1920s was not a mere clothing fad. It was a political statement. It meant he was a Gandhian. So this ends the chapter two of Prabhupada's early life before he met his spiritual master. He had his upbringing from his father, purely Vaishnava, especially on his mother's side. They were very, very devoted. He had his, from generations back, from Udarandas Thakur, his family of the Suvarna Vanik uh, Bamsta. And now, by the grace of one of his friends of the Mullet family, 
he was going to meet his spiritual master. And while sitting also with his god brothers, uh, he was sitting with Sridhar Maharaj, also reminiscing of this time when he met his spiritual master for the first time. So we have a little bit of time. We'll go on now to chapter three, called A Very Nice Saintly Person. This is a quote from Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. There has not been, there will not be such benefactors of the highest merit as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and his devotees have been. The offer of other benefits is only a deception. It is rather a great harm. Whereas the benefit done by him and his followers is the truest and greatest eternal benefit. This benefit is not for one particular country causing mischief to another, but it benefits the whole universe. Abai's friend, Narendranath Malik, was insistent. He wanted Abai to see a sadhu from Mayapur. Naren and some of his friends had already met the sadhu at his nearby ashram on Altadanga Junction Road. And now they wanted Abai's opinion. Everyone within their circle of friends considered Abai their leader. So if Naren could tell the <coughs> others that Abai also had a high regard for the sadhu, then that would confirm their own estimations. Abai was reluctant to go, but Naren pressed him. Now Narendranath Malak, of course coming from the Malak family, he was very wealthy and he used to give donations to the Bhagavazar temple. And therefore all the devotees knew him. And when he came, they would take him upstairs on the roof of the temple. No, it wasn't Bhagavazar at that time, it was Altadanga, I'm sorry. They would take him on the roof where he would be able to sit with Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. So after encounters with Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, Naren wanted to bring Abai to get his opinion. There was one other um, I just have to remember because it was an important part of the previous chapter about I will not be a master anymore. Um, all right, I'll try to remember it later. They stood talking amidst the passerby, passerbys on the crowded early evening street as a traffic of horse-drawn hackneys, ox carts, and occasional auto taxis and motor buses moved noisily on the road. Naren put his hand firmly around his friend's arm, trying to drag him forward, while Abai smiled but stubbornly pulled the other way. Naren argued that since they were only a few blocks away, they should at least pay a short visit. Abai laughed and asked to be excused. People could see that the two young men were friends, but it was a curious sight the handsome young man dressed in white khadi, kurta, and dhoti, being pulled along by his friend. Naren explained that the sadhu, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, was a Vaishnava and a great devotee of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. One of his disciples, a sannyasi, had visited the Malak house and had invited them to meet Srila Bhakti Siddhanta. A few of the Malaks had gone to see him and had been very much impressed. But Abai remained skeptical. Oh no, I know all these sadhus, he said. I'm not going. Abai had seen many sadhus in his childhood. Every day his father had entertained at least three or four in his home. Some of them were no more than beggars, and some even smoked ganja. So Prabhupada remembered that just like everyone would go out to work every morning, there were some men, they would go out and they would put on their sannyasi clothes and go out and beg, beg during the day and then come back to their houses. So Prabhupada was very well aware of who, what the character was of some of these so-called so -called sannyasis and sadhus. Therefore, he wasn't enthusiastic to visit them. Also, 
the Mullet family, Prabhupada explained that the culture was such at that time. Um, you see, Prabhupada says that everyone was a Vaishnava in his community. The poor people were Vaishnavas, the rich people were Vaishnavas, even the prostitutes were Vaishnavas, and even the Malaks used to keep prostitutes. The Malaks were also Vaishnavas. So Prabhupada saw, he explained that everyone from top to bottom, they were all devotees, but they were, had to practice their life according to uh, how they were going to subsist. So Prabhupada saw all of this, and he avoided the lower sections of the community, although they were all Vaishnavas. So Prabhupada, he was skeptical because he had seen so many sannyasis who were not actually practicing. Even at the age of 12, Prabhupada had taken, he had gotten his Upanayan Sanskara, he had taken his family guru, but later he rejected him. And Prabhupada said that was the correct thing to do, to reject the family guru in favor of the Vaishnava guru. Gormahan had been very liberal in allowing anyone who wore the saffron robes of a sannyasi to come. But did it mean that though a man was no more than a beggar or ganja smoker, he had to be considered saintly just because he dressed as a sannyasi or was collecting funds in the name of building a monastery or could influence people with his speech? No. By and large, they were a disappointing lot. Abai had even seen a man in his neighborhood who was a beggar by occupation. In the morning when others dressed in their work clothes and went to their jobs, this man would put on saffron cloth and go out to beg and in this way earn his livelihood. But it, was it fitting that such a so-called sadhu be paid a respectful visit as if he were a guru? So Srila Prabhupada, he hadn't yet met anyone who was a genuine sadhu. So therefore, uh, he was skeptical, skeptical to visit Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. Naren argued that he felt that this particular sadhu was a very learned scholar and that Abhai should at least meet him and judge for himself. Abhai wished that Naran would not behave this way, but finally he could no longer refuse his friend. Together they walked past the Parshanath Jain temple to one altadanga with its sign, Bhaktivinoda Asan, announcing it to be the quarters of the Gaudiya Mat. So after Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati left Mayapur and his years of performing tapasya there by chanting so many lakhs of rounds, he came and this was the first Bhakti Vinod Asan that he established here at one Altadanga road. And it was to this place that Narayan brought Srila Prabhupada. So we'll stop here and we'll continue next week. Uh, I didn't realize that we would finish so quickly. There was one important point where Prabhupada is explaining uh, during this time when he was working with Dr. Bosch. Oh yes. Dr. Bosch told him about this. When Dr. Bosch was a medical student, one of his professors, who was a, an Englishman, he said that in England, 85% of the students, they all have the disease of syphilis. Syphilis is a very serious disease that one dies from eventually. So Dr. Bosch, being a student at that time, he said, oh, that's terrible. And the, the, the professor said to him, why is that terrible? In your country, 90% of the, of the people, they suffer from malaria. That's also a disease. If you're suffering from syphilis or you're suffering from malaria, what is the difference? They're both disease. It's all diseases, just different names. So then Prabhupada took that and he applied that to the philosophy of Krishna consciousness. He said from Lord Brahma down to the ant, they all have the same disease. That disease that they're thinking, I am the master. The ant, he's digging a hole in the wall. 
He's constructing something inside of the wall. And Lord Brahma, he's constructing the whole universe. So both have that disease, think that, that, thinking that they are the master. The Prabhupada says, once you give up this concept that I am the Lord, I am the master of everything within my purview, then you say, or bap. I'm not the, the bap anymore, I'm not the master. And then you can become a devotee of the Lord. So whatever disease it is, it's all the same disease. Disease is disease, and thinking that we're master, it's the same type of disease whether we have the body of Lord Brahma or we have the body of an ant. And just one wonderful proverb that pra he Prabhupada told a little story. It's not directly related, but it was so beautiful. Prabhupada visited uh, Iran, and Iran being a Muslim country, he said in every single house he could hear the goats crying. So he said one time the goats went to Lord Brahma, and they said, our condition is so miserable. He said, the animals eat us, the humans eat us, and even the demigods eat us. Anywhere we go, somebody's eating us. So they prayed to Lord Brahma. They said, you please do us a favor. You tell us, what can we do? And Brahma, he looked at the goats, and he said, yes, I'll do you a favor. You should leave this place immediately, or else I'll also eat you. <laughs> Whenever he saw something, he had a beautiful Bengali proverb to tell. So we, have, we all have the same disease. Uh, we're all thinking we're the master. When we give up this disease, this material disease of thinking that we are the lords and masters in this world, then we can become humble. So now Prabhupada, being a young man, having his first child, now he wants to maintain a family, expand himself, make a lot of money. Yes, he wanted to make money also to support his spiritual master now that he's met him. But he was thinking, let me expand, let me become like Birla. And then he said, now I'm bigger than Birla, I have more than Birla, but what is the good? Krishna wanted to crush me in this material career so that I could take up this spiritual career. So from next week we'll hear about the inspiration that Srila Prabhupada received at this first meeting with his spiritual master, Hare Krishna. Okay.